All right, so here we have our photo bombs, and I didn't know what it was, and my son, my son Luke taught me what it was back in the fall, and pretty much what a photo bomb is is when you have a picture that is a good picture, and somebody or something comes in the middle of that, fo of that photo and messes it up. It's called a photo bomb. So photo bomb. So how many of you notice that life can do that sometimes? That you think that life's a picture perfect scenario, your family, your job, your health, whatever it is, your church, and something invariably will come in the middle of it and cause problems. And so we have a little contest we're doing here at Cornerstone Church. Someone said, well, where's this all expense paid trip gonna be to? I have to, I was joking around about that a little bit. We're gonna have a prize. It's gonna be one of the eating establishments that have golden arches around here. So we don't wanna mess up. No, <laughs> we wanna show some photo bombs here. And, and so you can see what's going on there. Someone messing up the photograph. These are some folks from our church. And you can go to our, look at that right there, photo bomb and their mama. And uh, we can continue to look at, this is a really gross one. That's, that's a spitball, by the way. That, yeah, that's a spitball. This is, you, yeah, okay, that, that's great. And so we, we appreciate that. There's some more uh, photo bombs there. And so if you have a photo bomb, go, and go ahead and submit it to uh, our website or photobombs at cornerstonecheshire.com. There's a photo bomb in the back there. And uh, these different things, uh, we'll have a contest. You're gonna vote on it. And then whoever wins gets a special all expensive paid trip to one of the eating establishments in the local area. That's all we're going to say for now, okay? <laughs> but anyhow, back to our, our time here today. It's basically how to learn to deal when situations don't go the way you'd plan them to go. I don't know if you realize that, but how many realize that that happens a lot in life, doesn't it? If you try to do something a certain way and, and invariably something happens, and this time of the year often is a time where these type of things happen more than others, right? We mentioned last time that holidays and Christmas in particular and New Year's, you get to hang out with your family and, and people and maybe people you would not normally choose to spend your time with, you end up spending time with. And sometimes it can be a little perilous <laughs> at times, right? And, 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 and sometimes during the holidays, it can be a very difficult time for some people during this time of the year. We understand that. And the reason can be for several different reasons. And sometimes you might be your first Christmas without your children. Maybe they've moved or maybe they're out of the area. Maybe it's a, your first Christmas not being married. Maybe it's your first Christmas uh, after a horrible thing that maybe losing a job or something like that or a health issue in your family. And sometimes it can be really, really difficult because Christmas reminds you of all the happy times growing up or perhaps not the happy times. And it's a reminder, as I mentioned the last three weeks, it's almost like Christmas is one big, long day. You, you, you go back into it again. And I get together my brothers. My parents are here today. Mom and Dad, it's so good to see you. Uh, Mom and Dad are here, the young couple in front. Uh, married 55 years, and they produce beautiful children like me. Uh, but anyhow, I'm their favorite. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but what happens is sometimes you remember stuff that went wrong in your life. And it's a difficult time. And so we recognize that as well. And what a better time to talk about when things don't go correct. Well, today I want to talk about the first week we spoke about the following. We spoke about how all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. That even in the midst of your difficult sets of circumstances, God can take it and redeem it for something good. He doesn't cause it to happen. But he can take the bad. He can take the bad things that take place in your life and my life, and he can redeem it for his purposes in a way that's constructive instead of destructive. So we talked about that that first week. The second week, which was last week, we spoke about the issue of offenses build fences and how if I get offended by somebody, if I'm not careful, I build a fence. And how many of us, when these things happen, the photo bombs go off in our work and our family life or whatever, church world, whatever you're involved with, it's easy to put a fence and quarantine yourself from knowing other people. And then you build these little caution tapes and you make these landmines that people are afraid to go in your life. You don't want to tell anything of what's going on in your life because they're afraid if they try to give you some instruction or encouragement, they might get blown away. And so we also mentioned the fact that you know, it's important to build a relationship with people and that we should be helping each other grow in Jesus Christ and have relationships where people care about each other. Doesn't mean you just put your pearls before swine. Doesn't mean you, you criticize everyone. No, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. But having relationships where we're challenging each other to grow stronger and greater in Christ Jesus, because none of us have reached it yet, and doing it in a spirit of humility, realizing that all of us are a piece of work in one, short, one way or another. We're all in a process. 
And so we want to encourage each other. That was last week. Now today, we're going to talk about something you might have heard of. Have you heard of the word fear? Okay. There's a lot of fear in the Christmas story, which we're going to look at in a few moments. Fear, perhaps, is one of the most controlling things, emotions in our lives. I would say it's a top three. Fear has a tremendous power to, to immobile us, to make us, uh, to stop from doing what we're called to do. Fear is an incredible force to be reckoned with. In fact, according to the psychological community, and according to research I've read this, uh, over the last couple of months, do you know what the most prescribed medication uh, for people in the United States is? Antidepressants, yeah, but do you know what the number one is? An anti-anxiety is number one. I didn't know that. So anxiety is a big problem in our society today. It is. People are afraid of a lot of things. They're afraid of the economy. They're afraid of uh, terrorism. They're afraid of losing things. And the Bible says in the last days, men's heart will grow faint from fear because of the things going on on the planet. And we can see a lot of that happening today. And so fear is a real issue, but what does the Bible say about fear, and how do we navigate through fear, especially when difficult times happen? And what often happens is this, fear often happens as a result of not being able to control our environment, isn't it? The great unknown. For example, if you're, uh, you're going to middle school from grammar school, it can be a little bit fearful. You're going from middle school to high school. Now you're all these bigger upper class mode. You're going from high school to college or, or whatever, and it can be intimidating and cause fear. Getting a new job can cause fear. How about this? How about the company just been bought out by somebody else? and they're beginning to uh, consolidate, and they're beginning to downsize, and you have a high position in the company making good money with good benefits, and all of a sudden, they're cutting people left and right. You think, am I next? And that, that little churning in your stomach begins to happen. Oh, my gosh, am I next? And you can't sleep at night and have a hard time going, you know, not thinking about it, and you're worried, am I going to lose my job? And I, I would say sometimes the worst part of fear is the fear of not knowing what's going to happen. It's like, I can deal with it. Once I know what the issue is, it's like a doctor saying to you, oh, by the way, we found a mass. What kind of mass? Well, we don't know yet. We have to take a biopsy. So you get the nerve to go into the office. They give you a biopsy. Oh, you got to wait two weeks. What? Two weeks? And, and, and for two weeks, you, you know what I'm talking about? You, everything you can possibly think of would go wrong, you have to fight to, to make sure it doesn't happen. And so that often is a case of fear. The great unknown is happening about starting a new job and all that kind of thing. And, and also, you know, the whole thing about having children. You know, it's night when you're um, dinks. You know what a dink is? Dual uh, income, no children. Become a dink to a married with children. M-W-C, okay? And now you go from a dink to a C. Now you have to pay bills and feed mouths. And all of a sudden, that can be fearful. And, and then it can be fearful when you're thinking, what's going to happen when the kids go to school? What's going to happen when the kids leave school? And you think of all these various things that can happen, and fear can take us over to such a degree that it limits us from doing what God would call us to do. And it becomes almost like as something you try to fight against and fight not to have. Why do we have these types of fear in our lives, and how do we deal with these triggers? So if you could open your Bibles, please, to chapter Luke, Luke, excuse me, chapter 2. The Christmas story talks a lot about fear, if you think about it. Think about how... All of a sudden, you have a teenage girl, probably 13 or 14 years old, in a culture that if, you have, if, you have a, if you're pregnant and have a child without a husband, according to the Mosaic law, you could be stoned and killed for that. Now, even though they're under Roman law, that still can happen with special people in the background. The religious community could do that to you. All right? It's a serious issue. So here you have a 13-year-old girl, 14-year-old girl, however old she is, a teenager that becomes pregnant out of wedlock. And imagine, the angel shows up, I'm just saving time here, she shows up to Mary and says, oh, hey, highly favored one, you're gonna be pregnant. Well, how am I supposed to do that? I don't even know a man. The Holy Spirit's gonna come upon you, you're gonna be pregnant. But I'm engaged to this guy named Joseph, and it's amazing how Mary deals with these set of circumstances, the great unknown. It's absolutely amazing. You know, we can learn probably the, one of the greatest people in the scripture in regards to personal character and how they deal with adversaries is Mary. You know, sometimes in the uh, non-Catholic churches, we tend to denigrate her or not even talk about it. But you know what? There's a lot to be said about Mary. Really is. <laughs> what an incredible woman of God. I mean, she said, let it be done according to your word. And she put her fear aside, and she boldly marched into what God had for her. And she was perhaps one of the most courageous people in Scripture, more than a lot of men in Scripture. It's amazing. 
As a matter of fact, everyone else in a Christmas story had a big problem with fear, and they struggled, but she handled it the best. And so what do we do when these certain circumstances happen? And you think about it. You know, we, we forget what, what it meant back in those days. It sounds so, you know, you see a nice little uh, uh, nativity set, and you see Jesus there, and the baby G and Mary, and it's all nice. It wasn't so nice. Can you imagine going home and telling your mother, uh, Mary, I noticed that your clothes are a little bit tight. Uh, what's going on? You eating too much of my, uh, you know, my food? No, Mom, I, I'm pregnant. What? Well, how? Well, the Holy Spirit came upon me. You know, that never happened before. We, we don't realize. Can you imagine the anxiety of going home and telling your parents that you're pregnant and God was the, God's the father? Think about that. That's ridiculous. That's never been done before. So you go home and say that. You have the opportunity to be stoned, ridiculed, ostracized. And then you tell your husband to be, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant. And Joseph, being a great guy, wanted to put her away quietly. I thought put her away in the Italian sense of the word. No, he didn't make any phone calls. He said put her away quietly that she would not be ashamed. And so Joseph went through that as well. Then he had a dream. God spoke to him in a dream as well. Hey, I want you to be with this girl. Now, they both could be stoned. Because now, I mean, Mary could have been stoned by herself, but now Joseph's saying, I'm going to identify with her, and I'm going to be the stepfather, and I'm going to stand beside her, and, and now they're not even married yet. I mean, significant amount of fear is involved with that. We see fear in political leaders. Herod was scared. Who's this Christ? Who's this child's going to come and take away my kingdom? And his fear drove him to murder, which we'll get into in a few moments. So we see fear having a tremendous effect upon the Christmas story, which takes place. And why do we fear? And what causes us to fear? I want you to open your Bibles, please, once again to Luke chapter 2. Uh, we're going to look at Luke 2, verse 9. And the Bible says the following, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. So here we have the glory of God touching them, and they see glory, and you're out there taking care of your sheep, and all of a sudden they see these angels show up, and the glory of God means God's presence came about them, and they were greatly afraid. And you'll see that all throughout the scripture, the whole glory of God came, and they were afraid. Moses saw the glory of God, he was afraid. Israelites saw the glory of God, and they were afraid. Isaiah saw it, he was afraid. So anytime God shows up, it's like, whoa, it, it can cause us fear. But the angels says, don't fear. And, th and this is what happens, a tremendous glory happens. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. How many know what it feels like to be filled with fear? It's like jumping into a pool of ice-cold water, and every part of you feels like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. This is the end. And this is what they felt like. They were scared. They were going through that. But there's a connection between the glory of God and the fear of people. Because the glory of God intimidated them to such a degree they were fearful. But the angel says, do not fear. For unto you, you know, talk about a child being, this will be a sign unto you. You'll find a child swaddled in swathing cloths and lying in the manger. This will be a sign to you. And so they, they calmed down. They had the courage to do what the angel asked them to do. They walked, despite their fear, they went to do what God showed them to do. But I, I want to show you the connection between Luke 2, verse 9, and also Romans 3, 23. So if you can keep your finger one, then go to the other. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. The same word for glory is used in both passages, by the way. It says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory, the presence of God. The glory is the presence of God. It's his, it's his when he shows up, his glory is about and around him. So the Bible says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The right way of God. And so here we have that. And when you go back to Luke chapter 2 verse 9. And they were filled with fear and the glory of God. So the glory of God often will help us to get to a point where we're fearful. Why? Because God is so magnificent and phenomenal and great. It's almost like being in the middle of a lightning storm. And you're sitting there and the thunder's clacking. Like, whoa, this is way beyond me. It's almost a fear begins to happen. Because of the greatness and the majesticness of what's taking place. And so what's so interesting, uh, Romans talks about this. Now, I want you to just uh, go with me for a minute to back about 4,000 years before then, or however long it was, to the Garden of Eden. Do you remember what happened to Adam and Eve? And they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they did that, the Bible says they were naked and they were ashamed and they were afraid. They ran from God. 
And, and, and they said, where were you? I was afraid. Because well, we were naked. Who told you you were naked? Now, it wasn't just clothes we're talking about. It was God's presence. Because when they had God's presence upon them, everything was perfect. They had God's presence. And we were designed to be in the glory of God. The glory of God is God's way of doing things. And so before that, they were, they were in communion with God. Now, what happened? The glory lifted. The presence lifted from them, and they felt naked. What do they do? They try to cover themselves so they would not be afraid. My friends, you and I do that today. We try to cover ourselves with our careers. We try to cover ourselves with, with our clothes. Well, not just, uh, I'm so glad, by the way, that you're covering yourself with your clothes. It'd be really a scary experience if you didn't do that. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, we continue on. Uh, but we cover ourselves trying to look the best and try to smell the best and try to be the best and drive the best and live in the best. And why? We want to cover ourselves. We want to be comfortable. We try to have a comfortable bank account and say if something goes bad, we have enough money to eat. And these are all good things. We work so we can take care of ourselves. And so we had this covering. The problem is all those coverings are temporary. All those coverings are not necessarily God in the say. And so when we don't have the glory of God, fear comes in. And, and, and since we have, we're naked and ashamed, we got to cover ourselves so we don't feel fearful, so we try to find different things. We try to find our careers. We try to find perhaps substances, perhaps um, different positions, perhaps whatever it can be uh, on the totem pole of society, we, uh, whatever you want in the church, wherever you're in a workplace, you try to find ways to cover yourself so you don't feel naked and fearful. And so we cover ourselves with many different things. And so what happened in the very beginning, man was covered with the glory of God and felt at peace with himself and in God. When we lost the glory of God, we try to cover it with other things. And by the way, you can cover yourself with religion too, by the way. You can cover yourself with church work. You can cover yourself with uh, all kinds of good things. But if it's not of God, it's going to leave you upset. It's going to leave you feeling that something's missing in my life. You see, sin creates a distance between God and man. And since God's not covering us with his presence, we try to cover it with other things. This is why a man fear, fears losing his job. Why? Because man was made, man and woman were made to work. Work was something that God gave us. It's a blessing to work. Now, back in those days, uh, you didn't have to worry about weeds. You didn't have to worry about uh, troublesome employees and all that. It was just nice. You work, and all the good things at work were happening. All the bad things at work didn't happen. But we were created to work, and work was supposed to work. Sin comes in, and now work doesn't always work so good. And so there's a gulf between what should be and what there is. And as a result of that, it causes fear and anxiety. Because why? Because we know this should be something better. Work should be better than this. You follow the, the logic I'm hoping to bring you here this morning, is that you have work that was divinely inspired by God, and now we have work that is flawed in sin, and as a result, it's never perfect, which causes us to lose control, which causes us to be fearful. So there's a gap between that. And why does a woman get afraid when she is, or a man during surgery, anticipating, well, I am designed to be healthy. My body is supposed to be healthy. That was God's original design was for me to have the glory of God's health. But my health now is not in the glory of God. It could be compromised. I could be sick. And as a result of that, you feel insecure. Because you feel insecure, you feel fearful. And so this is what begins to happen. You know, another side note I want to bring to your attention is this. And this is another side note. One of the major components of fear is the lack of control we feel we have over a set of circumstances. And we are supposed to be healthy by God's design. And we believe in this church that God does heal people. We've seen people get healed of cancer. We've seen people healed of back conditions and eye conditions. And, and yet what happens is there's something very frustrating about it. I'll just be frank with you this morning. Well, actually, I'm Eric, but I'll be frank for now because I'm afraid to be Eric when I'm talking about these things. All right. So I imagine we believe God heals today. We do, we believe it. But sometimes I'll pray for someone, they get healed. Other times I do, they don't get, they get worse. So because I cannot control it, it frustrates me. So therefore, I don't want to deal with something I can't control. So let's just say healing is not for today. And thousands, and many people in the church today have lost the um, availability and have basically quarantined themselves in the supernatural power of God because the Bible says you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, but we're afraid to do it because what happens, it doesn't happen. And since I cannot control God, it must not be existing anymore. That's pretty arrogant, by the way. And so that's why in this church, I'm, I'm okay. Let's go ahead and pray for someone. What happens if they don't get healed? What happens if they get healed? 
You see, it's the fear of not controlling. You see, it's so easy for me to talk about spiritual principles. It's so easy for me to, 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 to dissect the Greek and, and, and talk about the grammar and go to books and talk about all these principles, and I can control all that. I can control when you come to church, but I can't control who God heals and who he doesn't heal. And that causes frustration and anxiety and fear. So therefore, it must not be, since I cannot control it, it does not exist. Since I can't understand God, he must not exist. That's arrogance, by the way. And so that's the, that's the conundrum that we have in our life often. So we see that happening. And then um, if we were not for sin, we didn't have to worry about sickness and pain or failure and injustice being happening. We wouldn't have to worry about what's going on in Ferguson, Missouri. We wouldn't have to worry about the gulf that apparently is in between the races in America today and how, and have you noticed that things are polarizing more than ever now? Yet people are getting, that's not the answer. The answer to the race problem is Jesus Christ. They were all made in the image of God. Every person has incredible value. You know, it's not about, it's not about that. It's about knowing Christ is the answer. There was, a, there was a football player or a baseball player on CNN. He was talking about this, and the person cut him right off. It was sickening, and it was done on purpose. But that's the answer. And so how do we handle these situations? I love what um, Max Licato, some people love him. He's a, good, he's a fantastic author. And he has this book called Fearless, which I happen to have. And I underlined this a number of years ago, and I happened to look at it, pulled it off the shelf, and this is, what, this is what he said about fear. I think it's a great quote. He says, fear turns us into control freaks. Usually people that try to control everything are afraid they're going to lose control. Fear turns us into control freaks, for fear at its center is a perceived loss of control. When life spins wildly, we grab for a component of life we can manage. Our diet our tidiness of our home, the arm rests on a plane, or, in many cases, people. Since I can't control myself, let me control you. The more insecure we feel, the meaner we become. We growl and bare our fangs. Why? Because, because we're bad, in part, but also because we feel concerned. Martin Niemöller documents an extreme example of this. He was a German pastor who took a heroic stand against Adolf Hitler. When he first met the dictator in 1933, Niehlmer stood at the back of the room and listened. And he said, I saw a man full of fear. Fear gives way to the dark side. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Yoda just spoke to me. Okay, uh, it's true. Fear leads to the dark side, it really. It leads us to hate. It leads us to all kinds of, you fear something. And this is the thing about fear. Fear is so uncomfortable. It's a horrible emotion. I, everyone hates it. No one likes fear. But you know what? It feels better to be angry than fearful. Because you're angry, you have a sense of strength that comes in your veins. You know what I'm talking about? You're angry. Oh, I'm just angry. I want to let them have it. And you have a sense of control. So rather than be fearful, let me be angry. And this is why often the most fearful people are the most angry people in the world. And Adolf Hitler was one of those things. And it turned him to a wicked, demonically inspired dictator that did horrific things. The Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. But fear is remarkably potent in casting out love. Fear is remarkably potent in casting out out love. If you're not careful, fear can drive love right out of your marriage, right out of your family, right out of your business, right out of your church, right out of anything in your world. Fear, in taking the wrong way, can be very destructive in many capacities. Now, how do we get rid of fear? I, I, by the way, my title, I meant to tell my title, fear, turning fear from your adversary to your ally. Today, we're talking about how to turn your fear from an adversary to to an ally, that actually fear is a good thing in its proper context. It's a blessing from God. Well, you can have it, I don't want it for Christmas. Well, listen, we're gonna talk about it in a few minutes, just bear with me, okay? Fearing God helps eliminate fear. I'll show you what that means. Proverbs 9, 10 says the following. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is of understanding. Now, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, What's the beginning of foolishness? No fear of God. That's what we see happening in our society today. There's not a fear of God anymore, is there? You no, know, people, people don't, ah, oh, there's no consequence. I do whatever I want to, and foolish things begin to happen. You see, modern Christianity kind of turns, have you noticed, even the evangelical church has turned God into a big barney. 
He's a big purple dino. I love you. You love me. You know, hey, kids, how you doing? You know, do whatever you want to do. Praise God. Boop, boop. You know, jump bouncing around. And hey, God loves everybody. You can do what you want to do. And the guy, hey, he's a loving God. Don't judge me. And they go on and on. And it's all about I love you. You love me. And you live your life. And we just accept and love everybody. And, and it's all good because we've seen a lot of judgmentalism in the church that's been very destructive. But at the same time, there's no fear of God. He's just a big Barney in the sky. But you know what? My God is fierce. My God is strong. My God is so powerful, it will shake you to your core. If I could just take a pin, and imagine there was a shield that blocked the glory of God. If I just take a little pin, and a little bit of God's glory came in here, you and I would be on our faces shaking. Because God is so powerful. He's the God that made the universe. The Bible says in Psalm 34, 7 through 9, the angel of the Lord, listen to this. This is, this is encouraging, and this will help you. The angel of the Lord encamps. That means the angel of the Lord, God's angels. You believe in angels? Yeah, I'm married to one. But besides that, no, uh, I am married to one. But God, there are angels out there, by the way. There are angels. That's another topic for another day. It's not a naked baby with a bow and arrow. That's not what an angel is. I don't know where they got that from. It's ridiculous. Can you imagine that? Bing. Okay. Valentine's Day is coming. Get ready. All right, so Psalm 34, 7 through 9. The angel of the Lord encamps, in other words, it makes his presence around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Oh, fear the Lord, you saints. It's a good thing to fear God. We're going to share about it in a few, few moments what that means. There is no want in those who fear him. I like that. I used to be confused about that. You know what I used to say, Psalm 23? For um, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm like, why don't I don't get it? How come I don't want the shepherd? No, it means I will not be in want. And there's been times in my life where I've gotten to such a place in my worship of God that I've gotten so much in His presence that I got in His presence, and every concern, every fear, every worry was completely gone, and every question I ever had was gone in His presence. Because the answer to everything you and I experience in our life is not in an answer, it's in a person. It's in God's presence that we have our fulfillment. One day when you die, when we go to heaven, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, what's gonna happen is you're not gonna sit up there and answer him a bunch of questions. God, why this? No, when you're in his presence, it answers all your questions. Because his presence is the essence. His glory answers every story you ever wanted to know. And that's what happens in his presence. And so the, what happens, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And God, what does that mean? It means you fear God. How am I supposed to fear God? And, and I don't get it. Well, we'll look into another scripture to help us out with that, okay? If you could open your Bibles, please, to Exodus chapter 20. Just track with me here. You'll get it in a few moments if you don't get it ready. How are you supposed to fear God and not fear God? And I thought fear is a bad thing. And why you say fear is a good thing? Well, hold on. Let me tell you a little background story. There's a guy named Moses. There's a movie right now that did a lousy job depicting it. But anyhow, Moses was a tremendous man of God. God called him out of Egypt, and he, he was a failure. He was on the backside of the desert for 40 years herding sheep. And one day, God came to him at Mount Sinai and called him, said, hey, Moses, I want you to deliver the people. Who, me? I can't. I'm afraid. Just, I am with you, Moses. And so Moses, despite his fear, he walked in the favor of God and did what God told him to do. You know, let me just explain something to you real quickly here. Courage, there's no courage without fear. Let me say that again. There's no such thing as courage without fear. Because if you, if you have no fear, what's, you don't need any courage. So courageous people are people that battle through fear and adversity despite the fear. In other words, they bow down to God's plan instead of the fear. And this is what happened with Moses. Had an experience with God. God said this, you just experienced me, Moses. You heard my voice. I'm talking to you. You have a relationship with me. There's no intermediator. There's no priest. It's just God and Moses. He says, you're going to bring, the, this will be a sign unto you. <laughs> you're going to bring the people back to this mountain, and they're going to have the same experience you just had. And that's a, that's a job of a leader, by the way. A job of a leader is to go before the people and help the people get to where he just went. And that's what Moses did. Moses saw what was going to happen. So he called the people, brought them to the Red Sea and all that, brought them to Mount Sinai. 
So I want you to consecrate yourself. I want you to clean yourself because you're gonna have an opportunity to meet God like I meet God. And so which brings us to this passage of scripture. Please, you can open your Bibles to or follow along the screen. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 18. Now the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, and the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. The mountain wasn't smoking, it was, it was smoking, okay? The mountain smoking. And when people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then Moses said to them, then they said to Moses, excuse me, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. What happens? When you see God's light, all the lights go on, every little pocket of your life is exposed, and you realize how God's perfect and you're not, and that's a fearful thing, by the way. And you're like, I don't want that. Moses, you go ahead. I don't want to deal with that. I don't want God to get in my personal business. I, if I give my life to Christ, he might send me to, to Timbuktu in a dugout canoe, and I don't want that. I don't want to do that. I, I'll just stay over here. And so they were afraid to go to God because they didn't want God exposing who they were. But what Moses says. Then they said to Moses, you, verse 20, 19, you speak with us and we'll hear it, but let not God speak with us lest we die, which was an accurate, by the way, it was accurate. They were correct. God was very powerful and they could die. And Moses said to them, to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that his fear may be for you and that you may not sin. I was like, wait a minute here. You're telling me not to fear God so I can fear God. Hello, Moses, you lost your head? What do you mean? Uh, don't fear God, but fear God. That's what he's saying. That's because there's a difference of being afraid of God and fearing God. An electrician that's worth his electricity. <laughs> electrician has a healthy fear of electricity. A surfer has a healthy fear fear of an oceans and the waves and rocks, right? A skydiver has a healthy fear of falling so they understand. If you don't fear it, you can take it for, take it for granted. You get bit. And so what he's saying is that you need to fear God, but don't be afraid of him because God has something for you. And what do the people say? Do not fear. God has come to test you. Verse 21. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near. You know what happened right there? a whole nation had an opportunity to happen what happened with Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Only the high priest could go before the people for God. They had an opportunity thousands of years later, before to go before God face to face like a man talks to his friend. Guess what the people said? We don't want that. That's scary. We don't want that because we're gonna have to change our ways. So Moses, you go ahead before us. And fear stopped them from experiencing God. Is fear stopping you from experiencing God? Are you afraid that God's gonna send you to Timbuktu in a dugout canoe? Is that what, I've heard people say that. Is that what's scaring you? Are you afraid that maybe you can't live with your boyfriend or girlfriend anymore because if you go to God, he might tell you to do that? Is God gonna tell you maybe to, 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 to claim your income that you're not claiming? Is God gonna stop telling you to take illegal substances? What's gonna happen? I don't wanna deal, that's fearful. Is God gonna tell you to live a, a pure life? I don't want that, that's scary for me. I don't wanna know that. But do you realize you're missing out on a greater opportunity? God wants to speak to us as a man talks to a friend. And the Israelites lost it. Why? Because they were afraid of God. They feared God, but they, weren't, they were afraid of him, but they didn't fear him. Let me, let me explain what that means. Uh, we have a police officer, by the way, here, if you notice. And we have that for several reasons. We just think it's important to make sure that our children are protected and our campus is protected as a deterrent. Uh, it's just a way of uh, doing that. Uh, but imagine, if you will, if you're driving your car... And all of a sudden, you see these lights behind you, and they're blue and red, and they're, you know, some kind of, uh, it's a Crown Victoria or something like that, and it's a, it's a police car. He's behind you. Whew, and all of a sudden, you know what I'm talking about. It's happened to me many times. I'm sitting on the highway. Oh, no. Oh, I'm done for. And I see he passes me. And he pulls another fool down the road. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and there's been time. And, and you know, the problem is that just a few moments before he passed me, I was speeding. Forgive me, okay? Thou has a heavy foot. But anyhow, so I was, I was afraid. But, and, and why? Because I was behind me and I thought the cop was going to pull me over because I, you know, my, I don't know what was going to happen. But imagine, if you will, if, you're, if a dad is behind a teenager driving his car behind his teenage son or daughter and they're driving. Now, would the same amount of fear be on? Yes, no, probably not. No, not the same. Why? Because the father wants to help the children to learn to drive the car. And so he's behind them, and, and they know that he's behind them. they got to watch how they drive, but it's a loving, a building relationship. 
You see the difference? That would be fearing God without fearing the policeman God. But make no mistake, dad can also take off his belt. Are you advocating beating your kids? No, okay, let's not even go there. That's for next week, so come. <laughs> what does it mean to fear God? Well, you know what's so interesting about statistics of fear? This is really interesting. I did some, a little study this past week about this. And a lot of people are afraid of heights, by the way. Have you noticed that? Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen some of you afraid of heights. You're sleeping in church. Whoa! You think you're falling, you wake up in the middle of the sermon? I did that a couple times. <laughs> Yeah, I did that in a Presbyterian church when my dad was preaching. Okay, so don't you fall asleep, Dad. I shall sow what I reap. Are you afraid of heights? It's the second most reported fear. Are you afraid to fly? A lot of you are afraid to fly. Uh, you have, by the way, this is statistics speaking here, scientific research. You have a 0.00001% chance of dying in an airplane crash. On the other hand, the car insurance industry tells us, estimates that the average driver will be involved with two or three car crashes in their lifetime. Some of you passed that already by now. <laughs> and the odds of a car crash, dying in a car crash are 2% versus 0.00001%. Are you afraid of heights, which is one of the greatest fears of all? Your chance of being injured by falling, jumping, or being pushed from a high place is 1 in 65,092. The chance of your identity being stolen, they're trying to sell you life lock, okay, is 1 in 200. Do you, feel, do you fear being killed by a lightning bolt? Yeah, I kind of do. That's why I don't have a metal umbrella when I'm outside, okay? The odds of that happening are 1 in 2.3 million. You're much more likely to be struck by a meteorite. Those lifetime odds are 1 in 700,000. So really, we should be afraid of meteorites. You should have like a little metal thing with like a, like a Geiger counter walking around making sure there's no meteorites coming. Oh, thanks a lot. Now I have a new fear. Okay, I didn't mean to put fear on you, okay? Now, how about dogs? They really bark. The bark is bigger. This is what it says. One in 137,694 have a chance of being bitten by a dog. And, you know, the chance of being injured while mowing the lawn, this is why I don't like mowing the lawn, one in 3,623. How about sharks? Remember, Steven Spielberg has this movie called Jaws, and, and you've seen the reruns, and you hear about Shark Week and Shark Tank. It's a big, it's a scary thing. You hear it every summer. There's sharks. I mean, if you listen to the media, you think there's sharks off the coast of every place, and you're going to be bitten by a shark, and everyone's afraid of it. Do you know what the chances are of you by being bitten by a shark are? I, I know you want to know. I'll tell you. You have a chance to be bitten by a shark. One in 135,000 will be bitten by a shark. You have a much more likely scenario. You are more likely to be killed by your spouse than by a shark. <laughs> so, guys, watch your spouses, okay? da da da, -da. Okay? That's what's going to happen. Be careful with that. See, our fears, uh, what happened is this. The reason Christ came was to conquer our fears. He came to, to conquer our fears that we could get the glory back and have a relationship with him without fear. Now, let me just stop here for a moment because I need to. There are some people that suffer from clinical anxiety, and I understand that. This is not an opportunity to throw another thing on your list, to-do list, that you're not doing correctly. There are some people that struggle. There's a chemical imbalance. There's an issue going on. They have to take medication or they have to have special counseling to get it. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. People have high blood pressure and all that, okay? But, 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 if you will learn to think differently and do these things, you can walk away from that and lessen it. And I believe we should seek God's healing for it and believe God for it. But it doesn't mean you're a bad person if you're struggling with it. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Because I know people are saying, oh, great. He's going to tell me I can't fear. Well, duh, I don't want to fear, but I'm fearing. I get, I, we get that. But God, you can walk away from your fear by knowing him. And let him progressively heal you. You should always seek God's healing. So how do you let fear drive from your life? Well, Christ has come to restore the glory of God in your life and my life that we can experience our original intention and design. When we know our intention and our design and our purpose, it drives fear away because we know who God is. But let me ask you a question. What is the thing you're afraid of? This is what I found in life. 
Whatever I'm, whatever I'm afraid of, I gotta run to, not away from. If you continually run from fear, guess what happens? It follows you all the time. Fear is a really important tactic of the terrorist groups. They're so, they're so small, they're so insignificant that a pocket full of people can put terror on the world. And that's what the enemy does, by the way. He's so much weaker than God, and he uses terrorism to get us terrified. And the situation is, what are you afraid of? Don't run from it. Run to it. Face your fears. What's the thing that limits your life? What's the thing that if it was removed from your life, if this was removed from my life, I could be so much better? Well, what is that thing? Why not face it with God? So people are, some people are, fe- are fearful of Christmas being alone, fearful of not having a job, fearful of getting sick. I heard of a woman, uh, an elderly woman, a nun was trapped. This happened in 2011. She was trapped in an elevator. An 85-year-old woman, Catholic nun, was trapped inside of an elevator for four days and three nights. No lights, nothing. It was like an abandoned building. She was stuck in there for that period of time. And there was a, there was a story on CNN and Time Magazine, and I'll just read the story to you a little bit what happened here. And what happened was she tried pushing it and tried to get outside. She couldn't get outside. And she tried her cell phone, but like most cell phones, the batteries die. Fortunately, she had carried a jar of water and some celery sticks. So guys, please, carry a jar of water and celery sticks. <laughs> At first, she said to herself, this can't happen. But then she decided to turn the elevator into a personal prayer retreat. Just what she said. I either panic or pray. What would happen if we decided to pray instead of panic? She says, I decided to pray rather than panic. She later told an interviewer on for CNN, she started to viewing the experience as a gift. I believe that God's presence was my strength and my joy. And she said, I felt God's presence almost immediately. I felt like he provided the opportunity for me for a closer relationship. Some of us would be going out of our minds. But look how she took that experience and turned it around for something good. Who knows the thing you fear? Why not say, let me let God get, enter into this situation. Let me let God enter into this dark cell I cannot seem to get out of. And there's no way to get out of it. But you know what? I'm going to trust God. I'm going to draw close to God because God's my sustenance. God's my deliverer. And she believed that. And she was delivered. Though she was in a stuck elevator, she was free. It's not what happens to you. It's what happens in you, isn't it? So why not let God's power and his grace touch your life? So let your faith drive you through your fears. You see, what happens is if we don't do what God tells us to do, that means we're we're worshiping fear. You end up worshiping the thing you hate the most. Think about that. We hate fear, don't we? Everyone hates fear. Why worship fear when you can worship the king who who, who can kill every single fear? Why not worship God instead of our fear? You see, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. You know, personal people in history, the apostle Paul, you know, he said, you must stop preaching the gospel. I will not stop. Peter, John, you must stop. I will, we fear God more than we fear men. And we're not gonna stop. There are people of courage. You think of, you think of how they preached the gospel despite being killed. Everyone was killed except for one person, John. You think, of, uh, you think for example, Martin Luther King Jr. And how he, you know, he said, well, you know, the civil rights are kind of tough. Uh, I, you know, well, I'll let someone else do No, what did he do? He said, I'm gonna speak the truth about all men are created equal. And he marched, and, and what happened? He lost his life, but look at the freedom that he brought because he was a courageous man. Look at Rosa Parks. What she did, get in the back of the bus. No, I'm not getting to the back of the bus. In 2005, she passed away, but look at the legacy she brought us. You know, it takes people that are strong to stand up. And we need to be that kind of people today. Don't let fear limit you. A courageous person is not a person without fear. It's a person, despite the fear, says, I am not going to bow down to you. I'm going to walk through you, and I'm going to do what God called me to do. And fear, you're not going to control me. I'm going to control, I'm going to go after God. Why not live a life like that? Why? Why are you going to limit yourself with fear? But what happens if I die? Well, you get to meet God. (laughs) Not a bad deal. Listen. We gotta go after, we gotta believe. Don't let fear be your boss. Let God be your God, not fear. Stop being afraid of obedience. Some of you, I need to say this, some of you are so afraid to be single that you'll mingle with anybody. I mean, I don't wanna be single, I'm gonna mingle. 
And you start mingling with these people that are just really bad news. Oh, there's no Christian guys. No Christ- I hear it all my life. You know what? Just do the will of God and be the person you're called to become. I don't want to be alone. Well, why do you want to be with a jerk? You're better off being alone. I'm hearing amen for the married people. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding with you. How do we learn to fear the Lord? That's important. If you, if you fear God, you have nothing else to fear. If, you fear. if you fear man, you have everything to fear. Fear God, have nothing less to fear. Fear man, you have everything to fear. And so in closing, how do we do that? Well, Acts chapter 9. The early church was going on in the fear of God. They lived such a powerful life that people feared the church because the church was a people of integrity and character. First of all, we need to pray for the fear of God. I believe it's a missing element in our churches today. The big Barney God has to die. God is not Barney. God is fierce. He's powerful. He is amazing. Don't, you, should you fear God? Yes, you should fear God. But you can also have a relationship with God. Don't be afraid of God. Fear God. So ask God. God, give me a fear of you. The right type of fear, folks, not the wrong. Well, I'll just do what I want. He'll forgive me. What kind of attitude is that? You need to fear God. It's the beginning of wisdom, and his angels will camp around you. The fear of God comes from God, so you must ask him. And then, you know what? Go outside once in a while. Look at the sky. Go to the ocean. Oh, my Lord, look at that. Look at the storm coming in. I love going out in the middle of a storm with, it, with an umbrella. With electric, no, I don't do that, okay? I, I, I love to go outside and try to get hit by a meteorite. No, I like to go outside. I like to see nature. I like to see the, the crashing of the waves. I like to get out there and ride the waves. I love the, wow, the majesty and the glory of God's creation. That puts you in perspective. Go out on a clear night. Get out of the city. Go on a clear night. Look in the sky and say, all those are millions and millions of galaxies more like ours. Wow. That will make you give you a fear of God. The creation will speak of his glory. But let me just conclude with these last, last things. Philippians 4, 5 through 10 says the following. I'm going to ask if Esteban make his way up. Let your gentleness be known to all that the Lord is near. Be anxious for everything. No, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. The prayer, praying, supplication, getting detailed about what you're dealing with, with thanksgiving. I mentioned last week the greatest antidepressant known to man right now is called it's called thanksgiving, being thankful. I've tried to be depressed being thankful. It's kind of hard. You know, I try to be thankful and, and be depressed. It's, it's kind of hard to do both at the same time. It really is. It makes it difficult to be depressed, and that's a good thing. Let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. You see, I told you, his presence. Why do we come on church on Sunday? We come here to church to fellowship with each other, number one. Number two, to get in contact with God. I encourage you during the worship time. You know, ask God. I don't want to raise my hand. Raise your hands. The Bible says raise up holy hands. Somebody raising your hands and worshiping God. God, I worship you. You got a crew full of hundreds of people worshiping God. Why not join in with that? Practice his presence. His presence brings peace. His presence eliminates fear. The peace of God, which surpasses understanding. Why not practice your spiritual uh, muscles in developing your ability to get into God's presence? That you can do it at home. You can do it when you're driving your car. But keep your eyes open, okay? You can do all these things. It's wonderful. Why not do that? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brother, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue in anything praiseworthy, meditate on these. Why do you want to listen to music that talks about how lousy your spouse is or how lousy someone else is? Oh, you're no good. You're, baby, you're no good. Or I don't know what movies are out. Why do you want to listen to gangster rap? Why do you want to listen to depressing things? Why do you want to read movies and play video games? You're blowing people's heads off. Is that possible? Positive? Is that going to build you up? Why not think about what's good? Why not dwell on those things? First John says this, 16 through 19. And we have known and believe the love of God has for us. God is love. It doesn't say he has love. It doesn't say God has love. It says God is love. 
God is love. He's the essence of love. Now, you and I have characteristics of love in our lives. In fact, it says in Colossians, the Spirit of Christ holds the universe together. Do you realize if God pulled out his presence, everything would collapse? Even science is telling, there's something in the cell structure, there's something in matter that holds it all together. That's yeah, the presence of Christ. You pull that out of there, it's everything collapses. And we have known and believed that the love of God has for God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. The greatest antidote is experiencing the presence and love of God. 17. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Listen to this. There is no phobia. There is no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. That perfect love is God. Love drives fear away. If you will practice God's love, how do you do that? You listen to him, you spend time with him, you read his word, and you let his love bathe you. Let him touch you. Let him go, um, wash over you. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And if I fear God, I have nothing left to fear. Think about it. Not to fear your boss, not to fear anybody. I'm going to fear God. If, I fear, if you don't fear God, fear everything. If you don't have God in your life, you better be afraid. If you don't have God in your life, you better be afraid. And if you're not afraid, you are in a mirage. Because one day, you're going to have to face a God, and a tremendous God, a great God, a loving God. And your character and your personality cannot coexist with God. You would be burnt up. You cannot survive in God's presence without Jesus Christ as your covering. My friends, there's a day coming. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. You're going to have to go before God. And the only way to face God is through Jesus Christ and by what he's done for you on the cross. That's the only way. That's the only way. The Bible says that perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love we love him because he's first loved us. What shall I say then in Romans 8, 31? What shall I sell then? Say these things. If God is for us, who can be against us? You see, the Christian life is so simple. It is. It's, a little four-year-old can know it. Love God, fear God, and obey him. It's so simple. And experience God's love. It's so simple. It's the beginning. He who fears God has nothing to fear. If you're struggling with fear, we're all in a process here. I'm going to just take a few moments right now. God's not Barney, okay? There is a day coming. There is justice coming. Are you ready to face God? You cannot be good enough. You cannot say enough. You cannot pray enough. You cannot come to church enough. Only through what Jesus Christ did on the cross, he paid it in full. Only by receiving what he's done for you can you have a relationship with God and face God one day. Otherwise, you're hopeless. Let me just go ahead and tell you ahead of time so you don't get live in a mirage of false peace. And so listen, God loves you so much that the reason why you're alive to Listen, if you're alive today, it's because God has a purpose and a plan for you. You'd be dead if God didn't have a purpose for you. But there's a redemptive person. He wants none to perish. That means you. And Christ died for you. And if you'll give your life to him, say, God, forgive me of my sins. Fill my life up. And I choose to walk with you. You can start a new day today. Let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for dying on the cross for us. Lord, at the cross, at the cross, we sang that song. And Lord, we thank you that you died on the cross for us. And I'm going to ask you to, if you guys have to pray this prayer in the quietness of your heart. Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I choose this day to turn away from what I know is wrong. And I choose this day to make you my Lord, my Savior, and my boss. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And by your help, I choose to walk with you as my Savior, as my boss, as my Lord as my Father from this day forward, in Jesus' name.
Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time, it's a beginning of a lifelong journey with Christ. I'm going to ask that some of the prayer team make their way up. If you have these cards, you can fill out the cards, come forward, say, I prayed with someone. Tell someone today, I prayed the prayer today. But I want to have a concluding prayer also for fear. You know what we need today? We need bold and courageous men, women, and children to lead the way in this fearful world. How about we become the bold people that will change the face of this planet? It can happen. Let's just pray right now. Father, in Jesus' name, God, I ask right now that you touch every person at the sound of my voice, whether online or here. Father, in Jesus' name, you said that perfect love casts out fear. And Lord, you also said that you shall lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And Father, we don't understand why things happen, but we know you are our healer. And I ask right now across this room, and then whoever's listening to this, I pray right now a deliverance from fear, from phobias that have nothing to do with you in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for the power of fear to be broken over this place right now. In the name of Jesus, I, I command fear to go. I command anxiety to go in Jesus' name. And I ask for your love to cover every single person here, Lord. I pray that we would grow in love, grow in power, grow in grace. And Father, we would be a people that's fearless, that the only thing we fear is you. And because of that, we're fearless. God, I pray that Cornerstone would rise up to be a church that proclaims your grace, proclaims your love fearlessly. Lord, that we'd have fearless marriages, fearless students in high schools and grammar schools and middle schools, fearless students in college, fearless people in the workplace. In Jesus' name. Father, make us bold for you. We thank you, Father. We ask for your glory to come, that we could live in your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask, if Stephen would be so kind to, to close in one last song, I'm going to ask you to stand and out of reverence for those that are here. We're going to sing one song. And if you need prayer or want prayer for anything, for it doesn't have to be for fear. We're here just to join together and pray with each other, okay? Let's go ahead. At the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. May the grace, peace, power, and joy of the Lord fill you. And may his fear be your protection and your guard and your strength from this day forward in Jesus' name. Be blessed. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.